I'm Jim Benson, and you're listening to TV Time Machine. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and visit our show archives at tvtimemachine.com. Today on the TV Time Machine, we visit one of the darkest days in our nation's history as we explore Killing Kennedy. In this edition of our program, we are pleased to welcome Kelly Masterson, the screenwriter of the film Killing Kennedy, based on Bill O'Reilly's best-selling book. Mr. Masterson is an accomplished screenwriter whose work includes the film Before the Devil Knows You're Dead, starring Philip Seymour Hoffman. Over the next segment, Kelly Masterson will help us explore virtually every aspect of this compelling film, now available on Blu-ray and DVD. Again, for those of you intrepid enough to rendezvous with destiny, feel free to be a witness as we motorcade out of the present while opening a window to a tragic past. Kelly, thank you for coming on board the TV Time Machine. Thank you very much, Jim. It's great to be here. Now, you're the screenwriter of Killing Kennedy, based on Bill O'Reilly's best-selling book, which is now available on Blu-ray and DVD. Kelly, tell us about Killing Kennedy, and how does your film approach the stories of both JFK and Lee Harvey Oswald? Well, first of all, uh, Bill O'Reilly's book you know, takes a fact-based uh, approach where he sort of dismisses the conspiracy theories, not necessarily because he doesn't believe in them or doesn't want to approach them, but he wants to, he, what he wanted to do was tell the story in, in the way that, that we know is provable. So the Warren Commission reports and, and provable uh, facts about uh, the last days of John F. Kennedy and Lee Harvey Oswald. So that is the approach our movie takes. But what, what I think is different and what I think is going to be very interesting for people is that what we really wanted to do was get behind the story, get into the lives, into the emotions and personal uh, feelings of John F. Kennedy in his final days and Lee Harvey Oswald. And, and, and in his case, not just in the final days, but the arc of his journey that took him to Russia and back and to that fateful day in Dallas when he chose to pull the trigger and kill our beloved president, John F. Kennedy. Yes, tell us about Lee Harvey Oswald. What made him tick? Well, that was the biggest challenge for me. I did not know a whole lot about Lee when I started the project, and what I did know I didn't like. You know, I spent 50 years sort of despising the man for shooting someone that I loved so much. Um, I found him to be an absolutely fascinating and, and ultimately empathetic man and character. Uh, I... I found that I needed to, to, uh, to find a way to like him, or maybe even to love him. And I found it in the, the moment when he, this 19-year-old boy left the United States and went to Russia to renounce his citizenship. He wanted so much to believe he was an important man, a special man. He was delusional in many ways, believing in his own significance and in his own greatness. And that journey of a sad, confused boy to a man who five years later would shoot the president was a downhill slide of rage and frustration and sadness in that people didn't realize how important he thought he was until he gets to that moment when he wants to prove his greatness. And that is by taking the life of a man who he even admired. He, he bore no real animosity to Kennedy. He just knew that it would make people realize his own significance. Uh, and he achieved that in a way. He became famous, but only for a few hours because his life was taken the very next day. He certainly did have delusions of grandeur because he thought when he came back to the United States from Russia that he would be met by the press. He did. He thought he would be uh, welcomed, maybe even as a hero, someone who would bridge the, the, the Cold War gap between the two countries. He thought that he really thought him of himself as a patriot, and he was sorely disappointed that no one else really felt that way. And, and worse, no one really even cared about him. There were no <laughs> reporters to greet him when he came back. So if you could have interrogated Oswald, what would you have asked him? Well, I, I guess I would, have, I would have wanted to know, you know, the planning. Because one of the things we, we don't know is what was going on in his mind in those last few days. We have so little because he was taken from us and he was never put on trial. We don't really know that final thought process. Uh, we hypothesize in the movie uh, that he made his decision when he read the Dallas Morning News the day before the assassination and saw that parade route. And then he went to where his, uh, his wife was staying and where he had kept his rifle and that evening and picked it up. So that's what I would want to know. 
what is that moment? When do you decide that that's the act you're going to commit? Now, of course, public opinion about who killed Kennedy has shifted over the years. Has your opinion shifted over time as well? Yes, you know, oddly, it, it shifted a bit during the, the the process of writing this movie. I will admit that I am a bit of a conspiracy theorist, even still, because there are just so many unanswered questions and mysteries. But uh, my task, of course, was, was not to explore those, but to, to tell the story as Bill O'Reilly had laid it out. Um, I wanted in, in the film to sort of what I called knocking on each of those doors to show sort of the birth of each one of those conspiracy theories um, and how they, how they began. But I will tell you that over the course of it, I did come to believe, as the more I knew about Lee Harvey Oswald, that he would be the most unlikely co-conspirator. So if the mafia wanted to use someone, if the expatriate community of Cubans wanted to use someone, the last person they would want to use would be Lee Harvey Oswald, because he was so unstable, and he was such a loner, and he was so unreliable. I don't know how you would control him. So I guess in the end of the day, though, I still have questions. I am leaning more towards a lone gun theory. So when you were writing this script, what was your biggest challenge? Well, the, the two big challenges are how do you make John F. Kennedy a man rather than a legend, and how do you make Lee Harvey Oswald uh, a man rather than a monster? So those were the two things uh, that sort of weighed on me most heavily. And the, the process of trying to find those men inside those stories uh, it took me down a lot of roads, not you know, far away from Bill O'Reilly's books, um, reading what was left behind in the writings of Lee Harvey Oswald, trying to read everything I could about anyone who knew JFK intimately, um, reading a book that just came out last year, Conversations with, uh, with jo- Jacqueline Kennedy. Uh, there were interviews that were conducted with her very shortly after um, the assassination. So all of those things um, helped inform me as trying to find them as men rather than as legends. In terms of the evidence, you, you mentioned the Jackie Revelations. Do you think all of the evidence has been uncovered, or do you think new evidence is eventually going to pop up in the future as well? I think all of the evidence is, is, is kind of out there already. We have different ways of looking at it all the time, and every year a new book will come out that might give a new spin on new evidence. Um, I, I do think there is one last shoe to drop, and that is going to be um, Jackie's Kennedy's, Jackie Kennedy's uh, interviews specifically about the assassination, which were not included in what was released last year. The Kennedy family has sort of held those. I don't know that Jackie's going to give us new insight into facts and evidence, but I think she will give us new insights into emotions and feelings uh, and what happened that day to her and to the people very close to President Kennedy. Now, when you visited Dealey Plaza, what was that like for you personally? Uh, um, chilling, uh, frightening in some ways. Uh, talk about stepping into a time machine. Uh, that's certainly what I felt. Uh, there's also a great sadness that it's been commercialized. Uh, I went uh, in October of last year, and I had not been in many, many years. Uh, and to, to see, you know, people uh, on the street selling maps or uh, selling souvenirs of that day, uh, it just it, that strikes me as... Uh, as disrespectful, so there was that, that sadness as well. But also just the, the feeling of the closeness that I had gained by my research of you know, feeling more about who, who Kennedy were and who Oswald were. And so to stand in Dealey Plaza and to, to think about that and to try to feel that and look up in that sixth floor window and, and know that 50 years ago Lee Harvey Oswald was standing there looking down the barrel of a gun, uh, it's chilling. You mentioned the commercialism of the assassination. What should young people know and realize about this event in our history? They should know how it changed us, it, uh, how it affected very deeply the generation that came before them. Anyone who was alive that day knows the shock and the feel of that moment, in the same way that young people might remember 9-11 uh, or, or events like that, the Columbine shooting. Things that really shake us as a nation um, change us as a nation. Uh, it's always said that the assassination of Kennedy sort of stole Americans' innocence from us. I think there is some truth in that, that we've changed uh, as a nation in the way we feel about our presidents, in the way we feel about 
um, the events that take place around us. And I think there's a certain cynicism uh, and fear that has crept into the American psyche that I, I trace back to that day. So if the Kennedy assassination had never happened, what kind of country do you think we'd be today? Do you think we'd be oh, it's so less... Oh, hard to know that. It's such an interesting question. I, I'm very hopeful and optimistic and, and, and believe that that's what Kennedy represented. So I have to believe we might have been a more hopeful, peaceful, optimistic people um, if that had not been ripped away from us. Um, but of course, we'll never know. Kelly, what projects do you have upcoming in the future? Well, I have uh, a movie that will be out this this year that I wrote the screenplay for that I'm so very proud of. It's called Snowpiercer, uh, directed by a wonderful Korean director and starring Chris Evans and Tilda Swinton and a terrific cast. That should be out this summer. And then right now I'm working on a new miniseries, uh, which will be the first scripted project that CNN has ever done. And that's for the same producers that I did with Killing Kennedy, Ridley Scott's company. That's great. Kelly, where can people find out more about yourself and where can they purchase the Blu-ray and DVD of Killing Kennedy online? Well, absolutely purchase those, and I can be followed on Twitter at Kelly Masterson. Kelly Masterson, the screenwriter of the film Killing Kennedy, now available on Blu-ray and DVD. Kelly, it's been a tremendous pleasure having you aboard the TV Time Machine. Feel free to join us again in the future or in the past. Oh, oh thank you so much. <laughs>